Good morning, Laura Kerr. Uh, it's great to finally get you on here. I've been uh, searching you out for a while and uh, we've got you. It's brilliant that you're here to talk about your evolution as a javelin thrower, javelin coach, and uh, three-time European Cup representative for Ireland, Northern, former Northern Ireland record holder, and so um, one of the athletes you've worked with very closely since the age of 13, and um, what's almost the iconic, Kate O'Connor now, broke it with 52 metres and 92. Um, delighted you're here. How are things with you, Laura? Things are good, yeah. It, um, starting to look more positive for getting back on track this summer with competitions and things, and starting to plan for teams and European juniors and things. So, yeah, it's things are improving, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. And, uh, yeah, the sun is out today, which yeah, is always a bonus. Um, and um, I don't know, I, I guess there's an awful lot to look forward to. We, we've just uh, recently seen Kate break that heptathlon record. Um, again, with a, a, another solid javelin throw that saw a transition, I think it was from fifth up into second, um, and uh, do the business. But um, well, let's get back to you. Um, really, we're reflecting today about how you've evolved as an athlete, particularly through the ages of uh, 17 to 22, in those difficult years with degrees and exams and transitions from college and lifestyle changes as well. Um, and then we'll, we'll go on to um, your, your coaching roles as well. But if I could just ask you first, um, as an athlete, um, when, when did you first realise that you could be an international athlete? Yeah, I think for me, I was a club and a schools athlete kind of first from around 14, 15, you know, a multi-sport athlete playing hockey, netball, and also doing athletics and doing, you know, some sprints as well as some throws. I think the first time I thought, once the Irish schools medals started to come, um, I thought, okay, well, I am the best in the country at some of these events, but I think the really the first time I thought it was when I went across to Birmingham for what used to be the Young Athletes League, um, sponsored by McDonald's. It's called the McDonald's kind of league. Then I went across with Lagan Valley. Oh, you should be giving them a plug. Yeah, <laughs> and picked up medals in I think javelin shot and discus, and because that was the first time kind of at that British level against some of the the top athletes in the top clubs over there, I thought okay, I've got medals in all three. And actually, if I just want to pick one of these events now and really focus on it, I can be quite good. And actually, javelin was not my strongest. I remember, I think it was bronze in javelin, maybe gold in shot and silver in discus. And I just thought, I love the javelin. If I'm going to pick one, that's the one. Um, so kind of pushed on from there and then got some selections for Ireland to kind of... What age, what age was that? Oh. I was probably around about 15, 16. Yeah. Um... And then kicked on for, for Ireland and got picked for sort of small nations, internationals, things like we went across to Belgium. They still do the meet in Belgium, actually. But at that stage, I was still in school and picked to go across to, to Belgium to small nations thing. And they kind of joined that with a, a trip. They took us all to the Diamond League, which was held in Brussels, I think, that year. And just to see, I'd never seen really live international big scale athletics like that. And I just think that was really, really inspiring, like big crowd, big stadium. And to be able to go and like compete on the weekend and then actually watch the meet as well. I think that's when I thought, yeah, this is this is exciting. It's something I want to do. No, well, I won't say what year it was. But like you say, 15, 16, 17, they were the um, the, the, the key moments that, that made you realise. Yeah. Um, and, and then in, in terms of the processes you've worked on as an athlete uh, and various stages of, of your development, I know you said you went from predominantly three or four events and, you know, doing sprints alongside the shot that the discus and the javelin. Um, what particular processes were you working on as you were evol evolving through the teenage years? Yeah, I kind of see it like the milestones for me, at, like at 14, I was definitely a multi-sport athlete just doing technical throws work. I would say around 16, that's when I thought, okay, I'm better at, better at throws than I am at the team sports, but I realised I needed to get strong and I kind of independently took that on myself. I've always enjoyed the gym and so I, I got myself into the gym and I did get strong to supplement the throws work. But I think the really key years for me, probably going into university, I was um, selected into the Northern Ireland Sports Institute um, to really work there. I got access to like twice a week strength and conditioning, body composition, nutrition, speed plyos it was like the full package 
And I think really that was so crucial for me. That's the, that's the age that you need all of that, especially when you're going to university and things could go the other way. And you could, you could be on that verge of, you know, you're actually maybe going to drop out or focus on academics. So actually to have all those support people then put in and the expectation that goes with that, I actually think that was crucial for keeping me in it at a time when it, it, it might not have, you know, I might have, I might have dropped out. I also think that's when I found a coach who appreciated that there was more than just the technical. I'd always been in that club kind of setting, you know, two nights a week, go down and throw. Um, and I'd been taking responsibility for my own, you know, gym work and running and so on with no direction. But at that, that kind of age of 17, 18, to have a coach who had actually been the Northern Ireland record holder herself, Alison Moffat, who like appreciated the need for me to be doing all those other bits of work and integrated within the week and integrated with the Sports Institute. I just think that whole integrated programme at that stage um, was really crucial for me. Um, but I think I think through 20 and 21, it di didn't really work for me. Um, so I kicked on for a couple of years and then around 2021, I just... I was almost trying to be an overachiever and everything. I was, you know, doing a 20 hour a week work placement. I was trying to get a first class honours degree. I was trying to party whenever other people were. I was trying to train five or six days a week. I was just trying to do too much and I didn't really have any respect for rest or recovery. Um, and I plateaued. I kind of plateaued through 20, 21. And then I decided, well, last shot, I can maybe go across to the NCAA where I'd been offered a scholarship. And so for me, I kind of thought this is last chance. You know, I've, I've plateaued for a couple of years here. Um, and I went across there um, with, yeah, mixed experience, really. I'm not sure if you want to get into that. Well, well uh, I'm just going to probably jump back a little bit to um, your support crew. And you've mentioned Alison Moffat. Um, um, and what were the key things that you were doing? Yeah, and, and I think I should add that when, when you were doing technical things for throws, it wasn't just throwing. You'd have been doing perhaps lifting, conditioning work as well. Um, yeah, at that stage, I would say I tra probably trained in about five times a week. I would have been in the gym at least twice a week. And that was the difference from going from like the local leisure centre self-directed to having, you know, real accredited. Actually, at the time, there were Australian, um, two Australian guys who led that programme in the Sports Institute, uh, really competent with their weightlifting. Um, so I was twice a week in there. I was certainly doing medicine ball twice a week. I was throwing once or twice a week and I was sprinting. So it, it became, you know, it became that kind of full package of physical and technical work mm. at that stage. And it was properly kind of integrated through the week with rest, rest and recovery from a training side. But I would say that my respect for that at that stage to also take rest and recovery from my work and my academics and everything else, I didn't, didn't have an appreciation for it at that stage. I've got an additional question here for you now. Uh, it might be loaded, I don't know. But I often say to people, um, the shot putters in particular are often the fastest people over 20 metres in, uh, in athletics. Uh, and you were talking about sprinting as well. But uh, would, you, would you agree with that? Um, what would you say? Yeah, I would say I certainly had an appreciation and my coaches had appreciation of the need to do it. I think what happened to me was I was so much focus on strength that it was almost like the focus on the heavy strength, all the running in the world wasn't going to offset that. I became quite, I was forceful, but I was also applying that force quite slowly. I wasn't the type of javelin thrower who could handle like a fast, a fast run up and be quite elastic at the end of it. And if I look back now, the big missing component was probably the elasticity and the mobility to go with the strength. Um, so I probably actually started off relatively fast from team sport, got quite strong. And, and lost some of the speed and I think there's a huge place now for like gymnastics mobility you know I really try to integrate that in my programs and, and for me that's a bit of gold dust you know for the cross coaches out there listening to this is that you know don't neglect the speed and, and, and you know and um, remember that you need that fast that um that fast powerful movement you know and obviously fast release speeds you know whatever the event yeah I think as well especially with a lot of our male throwers coming across from rugby you do find, you know, that they're already very strong and forceful. Depending on the position they play, they're not necessarily elastic and mobile. And certainly I've worked with an athlete, you know, when we've got them up to, to 66, 67 metres. But it was kind of very hard to shake that sort of forward head posture, tight shoulders, tight pecs, you know, to really open them up for javelin. So I do think getting in early with the, the kind of, 
mobility, whether it's yoga, gymnastics. I use gymnastics a lot now, actually, with the, the young guys, especially ring work, um, just to try and open up, up through the shoulders and stuff. And all our warm-ups, so a lot of our physical prep is done through warm-ups. So with the younger age groups, um, we use a lot of, like, ground-based, like, mobility patterns. Excuse me. <laughs> um, and and I, I guess the, the next thing I was going to push on to before that interruption was... Um, you said then you kind of stagnated with lack of respect for the recovery um, during your later teen year, teenage years, and then you headed over to America. Um, yeah. And, and, and things perhaps were not necessarily as expected. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, so I got offered a scholarship to America. I was always going to finish my degree at home, so it was a scholarship to go and do a master's degree um, at McNeese State, and that was an NCAA, like D, D1 university, so good quality university. The guy that had recruited me was Ty Seven, who at the time I think was the American, had held the American record, was like an 85 metre thrower. He was the head coach and he was javelin coach. And so I felt this was going to be perfect. What I didn't realise is there's an awful lot of movement in the coaching staff um, in all collegiate, you know, kind of programmes. And by the time I actually got there, Ty had been recruited to the US Olympic uh, Centre in California. And so the coach that was then in there at the time was more of a heavy discus shot hammer coach he was only a year or two older than me at the, at the time um, and he just wasn't a javelin specialist to be honest and so we were all mucked in together all continued to get strong a lot of heavy gym work but it didn't really meet the technical needs that I had at the time um, and that that can happen people just need to appreciate there's a lot of movement um, in the NCAA and you really need to keep track of of the coaching staff and make sure that the the philosophy and the training philosophy of the coach that you're going to is actually aligned with your needs. I think too often people think it's too good to be true. You know, a free education, warm weather, it all sounds great. And and often it is great. And there's some athletes like really kicking on like Rashida at the moment. Um, and some of the British guys have had, you know, great success out of there. But I just think you have to go with your eyes open and you have to be informed about where it is you're going, but specifically who's coaching you and how they're going to do that. Um, a lot of the distance guys you'll know go in and they find their, their volume you know the, the, the volume is doubled in terms of miles per week you know but really they should have known that before they've gone there um, and they should have worked through those those things yeah no I, I agree with you on that one I, th I think the other point that, that's important to make is that at division one level that's the pinnacle of the coaching career of uh, many staff in the USA so I, I think you're right you know everybody's trying to get those jobs and uh, uh, and, and you know um, I, I think there are some places where staff have been for years and years and years loving it. John McDonald that I can saw um, was there for a long time. And yeah. I know um, the coaches that I worked with, um, they, they were probably there for 10 plus years. Yeah. But, but at the same time, I do know Division 1, everybody's trying to get there. So everybody's making the career moves. And what I should say as well is, you know, that young coach that was there at the time and he was a graduate himself for me at McNeese. I mean, he's gone on now and he's at Oregon. And he's having fantastic success. He's really matured into his career. He's got a phenomenal program, multiple NCAA champions. But just in terms of the timing being right for me, he was early in his career. I was early in mine and it, it didn't match up. The event specific needs just didn't match for me at the time. I also got glandular fever out there. Um, just was run down. I didn't handle the heat well. Lots of volume of training. Um, stifling heat at times, 35, 40 degrees. Hurricanes, you know... Um, just a lot of a lot of things. It was almost like the perfect storm um, for me, and that's not. I absolutely think it's a great opportunity for many athletes. I just think be informed about everything from coaching to weather um, to how your recovery is going to work, what your competing needs are going to be. Like universities, they've obviously got their indoors, their outdoor, their road. Athletes need to go in understanding that they're going they're going to be there to play for the team, and so there's a requirement for them to score points. And they need to know. And I think there's a, a role with the coach at home to prepare them for that as well. I don't think you, you can just go, well, I've done my job here and on you go. I think if you know an athlete's going to the NCAA, then the responsibility lies with that coach at home 18 months out to start preparing for the transition as well. Yeah, yeah. Really good punch. And, and that's uh, what I expected. Lots of gold dust from you, Laura. Brilliant. Um, moving on, I mean, challenge at one of the questions I've got here is asking, asking you about overcoming challenges in specific aspects of training. Uh, I know you've mentioned earlier that you enjoyed being in the gym. 
Um, but you enjoyed that over doing what? Um, probably, I, I kind of took charge of doing too much of that for myself, probably in the years where there was an absence of other input. Um, so probably more, you know, I probably didn't have the input with the early coaches around plyometrics, mobility development, um, even like the goal setting that comes around, like structuring your season properly. I could probably look back at little training areas from when I was 15 or 16. And if, if there was a meet on, I was doing it. So it almost seemed like I'd pick every javelin in the country and go and compete at it. Mm -hmm. And there was just, you know, and that's whenever you turn up to your club two nights a week and just receive technical coaching, then there's so much more that you're missing around goal setting, planning, periodization, tapering, peaking. Um, so yeah, in the absence of some of that knowledge, I just thought, well, just, just get stronger, just get in the gym. And, and uh, but, but what aspects of training did you not like? Was there anything you, you really didn't want to do? Or, 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 you know? No, I, I actually did enjoy all training. I wish that I would have been exposed to some of it earlier. And I wish that some of the, the things that we do with the youth now, um, that I would have been exposed to as a youth. I think I struggled with the lack of ex sort of training partners and exposure to other athletes. All the coaches that I worked with, and I, I worked with three or four, mostly they were coaching one or at most two other people. Um, and for me, that makes it hard to stay in. You're, when you're young, you want to be pushed, you want to be social, you want to have your friends in your training group. And that's a big driver for the youth academy now um, that I kind of manage within Athletics Northern Ireland is I appreciate you know, a lot of training can't be done together in terms of sprinters, jumping throwers, but actually so much can. They can be in the gym together, they can do some of their gymnastics together, they can go warm weather training together. And I think that that's what's going to keep them in the sport is being part of that collective community of athletes. So I actually loved all the physical training. When I look back, I just say I missed a group dynamic. Right. That's, yeah, good, good point. Very good point. And um, moving on to the next question. Um, what have been the positive aspects of your coach at those key ages? And I know you've mentioned some things already, but if you want to just highlight the qualities of the coaches you've worked with. Yeah, I think qualities of different coaches probably initially finding that coach who was Alison, who had had, you know, competed at a high level herself. She she knew what it took um, to to kind of get those European Cup selections to get, get selected to GB or to Irish teams. Um, she knew that it took an awful lot more than turning up to your club two nights a week. Um, also looking back, you know, mentoring wasn't really a term that was used then very much. And we use that now in lots of mentoring programs, but she had kind of the foresight to, to bring me across to, to British squads, to bring me across to some of the best of the British coaches. And I actually look back now and I think, well, that was almost 20 years ago, but that was very progressive. And it was also very, open-minded to appreciate that actually there was, there was more to know and more to see and I think it's that big fish small pond you can easily sit in Northern Ireland and feel like you're you're having great success and you're the national champion or whatever actually there's a there's a much bigger world out there and you need to be exposed to some of those British athletes so I remember going across to squads and like Mick Hill and Steve Backley being there and Goldie Sayers and that's exactly what you need to see as a young athlete and you don't you don't need to shy away from that so she was very supportive of all of that. And even there were times where we, you know, she would have paid her own money. I look back now and that should never have happened. But, you know, she paid her own money to get me across to other coaches and she went there as well. So that was certainly um, qualities that I really appreciated is that, you know, coaches being on a continuous personal development journey as well. And then I think just from the NCAA, there was still a lot to be learned. I didn't progress as an athlete, but many people there did. The way that they structured and managed training, you know, to, to make that almost a full-time program to fit in with the academics, to utilize the recovery methods um, and to be able to bring together throwers from all four events, so javelin, discus, shot um, and hammer, to be able to do a lot of their training together. I certainly learned a lot about group management um, and working with bigger numbers and kind of preparing for competition that, that way. So I think there were definitely positives to take from the NCAA as well. Good, good. Um, and the other thing that um, we've not mentioned that I think is important is uh, you've got to keep a, a good academic level uh, in the uh, collegiate system in America. Uh, I know when I was there, one or two people got kicked off the programme. So, yeah, 
I, I'm sure you didn't have a problem there. <laughs> no, I didn't. I um, no, I graduated with a, a four point masters, so um, that was all good. But I do think that the way that they, the coaches, have an appreciation for the whole athlete and their academics and their future as well, I think that that is admirable and almost that idea of if you drop below a certain grade point average, you're actually off the team and you need to go away and you need to, to bring that grade point average up because there are too many young athletes probably trying to live the dream who think, you know, I'm going to go to the Olympics so I don't need a career and actually everything about the collegiate system is telling you you must have that dual career, you must get your academics in order and um, I think that serves them well. So that's a, that's another positive of that system. Yeah, I agree with you, absolutely. Um, final question as an athlete, um, how, how, how do your, um, taper days, how, how do you taper for championships and things like that as an athlete? Um, and you might want to talk about maybe some of the mistakes you might made, you know, as a younger athlete in that 17 to 22, you know, talk about your downtime now and, and how you taper. Yeah. Um, I think as an athlete, probably things tapered back from the the heavy strength work and stuff to probably more potentiation type work so more explosive work almost like in a three week taper down you know the high the high loading would would ease off the high volume would ease off it would be more around rate of force development in the gym and stuff i don't know if i ever really had a great understanding or appreciation for it so i probably couldn't do my coaches justice in explaining um but certainly it there was a, a taper down of volume and intensity um, where I've got to, and I'll, I'll jump into the coaching part a bit a bit more now, with my athletes, I used to take that approach as well of just taper everything down. My approach now is, the, yeah, that's one part of it, but actually the more important part is the competition day rehearsal. And what I find myself doing more now with athletes, probably four or six days out, is actually replicating what's going to happen on the day. Because I used to think that tapering was an entirely physical thing, you know, just strip back the loads and stuff. Actually, it's as much about what time you're going to turn up, how you're going to be mentally ready, what are you going to have eaten, how many warm up throws are the officials going to allow you, how long is the call room going to be. And actually, I think now in taper with the athletes that I work with, those are the things we need to be rehearsing. And so tapering off the volume and load is just a very small aspect of it. It becomes more about the mental rehearsal of being prepared for everything that's going to happen on the day um and, and running through so even the session i'm going to go to in a few hours today is a competition rehearsal at our local track so the athlete i'm going to see is you know he'll turn up he'll do a competition warm-up three he's a decathlete he'll do um probably only get two opportunities in the discus cage before he has to do a measured throw he's only going to get three because he's a decathlete and we'll probably actually run through that process twice in today's session and we'll probably try and take some learning from what happens first time around, try and do it better the second time. And only once that's done, will we then actually do some technical work. Um, gotcha. Yeah. No, that, that is, you know, again, more gold dust there. Thanks very much for that, um, Laura. Uh, moving on to uh, your life as a coach then. I mean, uh, obviously you set the Northern Ireland record that, that, that was held so recently um, in a javelin. Um, and, and then you've moved on to coaching. Um, how how has uh, how has your coach development um, evolved? And also, um, what are the main coach processes that you focus on and have to change? Yeah, so I I pretty much retired. So whenever I finished in the NCAA system at twenty four, I guess just turned twenty five, I just retired. I realised I'd plateaued for too long wasn't going anywhere, wanted to do other things. So I started it off in a community coaching role with Athletics Northern Ireland and the local council, just out and about in the schools um, and in the clubs. 20 hours a week, really, probably delivering eight or 10 sessions. Did that for a couple of years and progressed into then um, a club assistant kind of support role, um, then covered maternity leave and talent. Um, but all the while I kept, I kept kind of volunteer coaching as well. So I'd spend my own time evenings and weekends with, with throwers as well. So I guess there's those two strands of trying to develop as a professional um, where I'm now the talent lead and I manage the youth academy. Um, but my day job is certainly not to coach throws. Yes, I you know, manage athletes, manage services, manage S&C sessions, camps and so on. Any throws coaching, 
I do is is additional to that um, in my own time. So I think initially I've always looked for opportunity to get around the best people. So I mean, I became accredited as a strength and conditioning coach at 21 or 22. So that has served me well, that appreciation of physical prep. I've gone, I think, to Finland at least twice, maybe three times to the world and European javelin conferences. Um, some of it really kindly supported, but always, you know, with some of my own cost as well. So I haven't been afraid to invest in my own development and then just putting myself out there. Um, I've worked across British and Irish team staff and, you know, been mentored by some really great people as well, like Peter Stanley in the field events at British Athletics, just to see how he manages those teams and manages the feedback on the big occasions um, to the athletes as well. So I definitely, yeah, I've, I've always looked for opportunities to just grow as grow as a coach and I've, I've tried to, to do that beyond Northern Ireland to try to travel as well but the second thing you asked me there I think was about my processes as a coach yeah um, I think I suppose there's there's probably three or four key things that I believe in and in, in where I'm at now um, with my coaching I think one of them is athletes need to be physically prepared to tolerate the demands of the sport you know what an athlete experiences in their block leg for javelin or their hop phase of triple jump, it's unlike anything they'll experience in another sport. And I think physical preparation for athletics needs to, to come in a little bit earlier. Um, and I think kids do need to be prepared for the very unique demands. And team sport will, you know, is great, but it won't prepare for the specific demands. So, so that's one of the things I kind of hold close. I think also the physical preparation of young people like PEs on the decline. And so most people used to be exposed to gymnastics and all of that through their schools in PE and that probably did help prepare them. Um, I think what the experience now, I think is it there's something like 37 hours a week of mandatory PE in Ireland and that's it. I mean, or sorry, 37 hours a year. Yeah. So that's not, um, it's not really going to be adequate. So we can't say all oh, my multi-sports prepares me because it simply won't. I think another process for me is like holistic development as well so it's not just physical and technical um for me there's there's everything else that goes around it there's kind of integrating performance services there's injury prevention um there's have, having a dual career and all of that as well so that's a big part of our our youth academy in northern ireland integrated services and i mean you say holistic um, and i must admit i wasn't necessarily thinking of the integrated services that and we're obviously talking about elite athletes when we've got those um but um other holistic listful services there uh, are listful things yeah um i'll show you actually because i've got a little slide here um that might help it make sense but um these are these are just two of the athletes i work with actually just on the slide but i suppose it's just even with teenage athletes um it's integrating all of this so yes, you have your physical preparation, speed, technical, strength, the technical prep we know about, but actually what about the lifestyle plan planning? You know, it's people think of it as something you do with, you know, how's a, a senior high performer going to manage their work and lifestyle around preparing for the Olymp Olympics, but actually on the most basic level, you know, young athletes need to be able to manage their school, their homework, their travel to training, um, their money to buy a car, their transition to university. So. I think that that needs to happen even at the teenage stage as well um performance behaviors things like nutrition mindset sleep there's a there's a place for that and i suppose appreciating that was a big gap area for me as well mm -hmm. um and i suppose just having the the mental skills on the day to perform when it matters um you can have all of this other physical and technical stuff but if you can't overcome your nerves or handle a bit of pressure or bounce back from an injury um, then all of this doesn't really come to produce a performance. Um, and then I just think putting it all together and actually planning for how does this all fit in a week and a month. So um, that's kind of what holistic holistic development means to me. And in terms of services, you know, of course, a young teenagers not going to be fully supported, but they will encounter a physiotherapist. They will encounter a nutritionist and so on. And it's the coach's job to make sure that they experience that in the right way at the right time the parent understands it and it all fits with the overall plan for the athlete i think you're right in the sense that, that these days um talent id and uh, nurturing that talent 
across the country, it's happening more and, and far more younger athletes are being exposed to it and far more athletes are studying it via, you know, PE qualifications as well. So absolutely, yeah. I take your point on that one. Yeah, I think just we, we need to give athletes every chance. You know, there's a finite window for an athlete to have a great experience in athletics or to probably drop out and never come back or to go to another sport. So we need to make sure the experience that we're giving them it is fairly well rounded and is engaging and is going to prepare them to overcome the challenges as well. And if we only do the physical and the technical, the, the first time they come to a, a hurdle like an injury or, do you know, an illness or something that they've got to, got to overcome, um, they're likely to fall at that hurdle and, and that's possibly when the dropout happens. And we know that the dropout in athletics is through those kind of middle teenage years. I also think at, at that point, it is those athletes that uh, leave one club to progress themselves and go to another club. And then yeah. if you get injured at that new club, suddenly, hopefully they can go back to, you know, along the bridge that they came from. But, but if that bridge has been burned, yeah. it just makes it harder to keep going through the difficult times. So, so I think that is a good point. Mm. Good stuff. That, 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 yeah, that, that's a great slide and, and that highlights a lot of key points um, and obviously some of the processes and, and thought processes that you go through as a coach. Um, looking at you as a coach, Laura, um, and I know you've talked about how you, how you focused on various aspects uh, as, a, as a younger coach to develop. Um, what are you focusing on these days to develop as a coach? Yeah, I suppose like I'm definitely not the finished product as a coach. I think one aspect of it is probably like competition day planning, um, competition day coaching. I think as a young coach, you know, you're trying to develop your technical model for your events all the time. And I've kind of come to believe that just because you see something happening in competition doesn't mean, especially in the technical events, it does not mean you need to say it or talk about it. So I think I'm getting more towards you know trying to minimize my interference on the day I want the athletes to flow I want them to get better round to round and I don't want to kind of cripple them with information overload um, so I'm definitely trying to refine my competition day process all the time and I think that's something British teams have been good for me there like working with Peter Stanley and trying to you know his mentoring approach would be encouraging team staff to be the best facilitator they can be but ultimately the athletes selected to a championship because they have done a performance that already merits them getting there. So that a performance is already in them. And what you need to do is give them the space to let it happen on the day and not, not interfere. So you need to be available, but not, not kind of overburdening them with information. So I'm trying to get better at that. I think you, you, you've mentioned, you know, three pieces of gold dust for, for me there that I often see at championships and that is, you know, obviously minimizing interference you know what is the right pitch who's more nervous the athlete or the coach and, and, and quite often it's the coach that's more nervous than the athlete because mm -hmm. we know that those are uh, high achieving athletes that they have a good um often they have a good arousal management system in place and they know how to manage it and how to perform uh, sometimes the coaches don't necessarily match that um but but also i think the information overload is a key thing that you know, and sometimes a nervous coach might accidentally just say too much, yeah. as I'm sure we both know. But, but the, the, the key thing you finish with there, and I'm, I'm repeating what you've said, but I think it's such gold dust that it's important to um, to say this, is to become the best facilitator that you can be and bring out the best in them. Yeah. Yeah, I think at that point in competition, the hard work should be done and it's about letting it happen on the day. I think other areas, I suppose, that I'm still trying to work on as a coach would be like my attentional focus almost within sessions. I think inevitably when you run coaching sessions and technical events, you know, there's an element of everyone will be there in the same space doing the same thing. I think I'm trying to get better at managing what are the individual goals for that athlete and how can we within the same session and the same space actually individualize. Um, so I suppose that'll process I'm using, I'm spending more time preparing for every session now almost just taking notes to keep myself on track and trying to use processes like recapping with the athlete individually what we're going to do in the session and recapping individually at the end um because i think as a young coach i was definitely guilty of here's my script this is what we're going to do today and we're all doing it and you're probably all going to get the same feedback and i think it is 
it's a skill to kind of mentally have three or four trains of thought going on at once to kind of have individual needs for each person remember what all those are between every throw especially in javelin where they tend to line up and it's one two three and you've got to differentiate your feedback in between so i'm still working on that i would say um another thing i'm probably still working on i think this one's huge is my relationship actually with with parents i think they're the biggest influencers of, of young athletes especially teenagers and I've definitely experienced parents with unrealistic expectation, both of their child and of me as a coach. I've always so probably come across parents who I might have a long term view um, for what we're doing with the athlete and appreciate it as like a four or five year journey. But I've come across those parents who just want all the success now and they don't understand why we can't do it all right now. Um, and then I've also come across maybe those obviously some really supportive and really helpful. And then there are also those who just overstep the boundaries and almost will undermine the coach or will suck up all the knowledge for years and years and then decide, well, they're going to do it themselves. So I'm trying to get much better actually at setting clear boundaries with parents, setting my expectations of them. Um, ultimately, if this is something I do as a volunteer in my own time, um, I need to be a bit more clear at the outset about what is the role of that parent and what's the boundaries Um that we that we both won't cross um and so that's that's something for me i think when you're a young coach especially um sort of mid or late 20s i allowed myself to be dictated to by parents i think you get a little bit older and 10 years on you kind of have some success and you you trust in what you do and actually you're going to lead your program and and the parent should not be leading the program the parents should be supporting the challenge for the child um so I'm trying to get better at, at managing all of that um, all the time, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think you've mentioned really good points about um, working with parents. And, and there's no doubt that, uh, you know, often the parents are the, uh, the athletes, you know, eight, eight plus hours a day. So they have much longer time to influence them. And if, um, if, if they've um, on board with the uh, coaching program, then invariably they can uh, reaffirm it and support it um, you know, throughout the day and um, um, day in, day out. And, and yeah, absolutely. I think just our competition is so important where parents do choose to travel. The messaging there is so important. Do you know, if the, if the coach is leading those sessions three, four times a week has, has produced the athlete, you know, to that level where they can perform to achieve a selection standard, the last thing you need on competition day is a nervous parent over the fence or in the team hotel or you know, um, so I just think, I think clear boundaries, but I think, you know, I'm not trying to say these are all the problems with parents, but I think being an assertive coach and setting out your philosophy and your boundaries quite early, a big role sits there with the coach. There's no point in the coach being frustrated later. It's better to work th through these things before you get to the championship or before you get to those crucial moments. Really, yeah, really good point. Absolutely. Okay. Um... Moving on to your support crew, um, who are your support crew? Who do you work with um, yeah. to get the best out of the athletes? Yeah, I mean, obviously I've, I've mentioned, you know, a few people have been great mentors at, at British Athletics and stuff, Peter Stanley, who's, who's now retired. But in terms of, you know, a big part of what I do is, is, is the Youth Academy. And I suppose I'm answering a lot of these questions as the talent lead for Athletics Northern Ireland rather than just a, a personal coach. But I would say, you know, give a lot of credit to, to both of our directors that we've had in the last I guess six or seven years at Athletics NI. Um, Tom Crick came in um, to Athletics NI when we already had really Tom Reynolds and I had a vision for what we wanted from talent and we had the drive to do it and Tom Crick came in and he, he wrote a great strategy that allowed us to play to our strengths and he you know he wrote our vision for talent into that strategy and he gave us the space and he pushed us hard to to kind of get delivering on that and then obviously you'll know Jackie came in after that and again gave us just the, the space to grow our own vision for it and appreciated where Tom Reynolds and I were already at with our knowledge for it and I think that's exactly what you want from a director is, is the space to be able to to grow what you're doing um, the resource to do it the respect and the support to do it and to be challenged as well um, so in terms of support crew I don't think without both of those two directors in their time 
here I don't think I would have been able to, to grow you know the, the model for the academy and to refine it and to push it on and I just think like Northern Ireland athletes have set I think it's 26 national records in 10 years um, 18 junior records I think it's 17 under 18 records we should be incredibly proud of that those two directors should be incredibly proud of that and I think we can be and you always do it against the backdrop of, of some of the cynics who might be prominent on social media but in the end the, the numbers speak for themselves so I would really regard both of those two directors as hugely supportive for us in Northern Ireland and then just Tom Reynolds' knowledge of, of performance statistics and what it takes to break through to championships and where those opportunities lie. And then recently in our team, we've taken on Amy Foster as well. And to be able to get her onto our staff team immediately post-retirement, I just think the perspective she brings, um, having had such a long career, she's a straight talker. She keeps us a little bit on track. Um, and I just think she's such a, a fresh athlete perspective as well. It's great for parents and athletes to be able to hear really what does it take to have a career in world class athletics that spans you know three Commonwealth Games and and worlds and stuff. So that's a team that are that are important to me, and I've got a lot of respect for them all. Um, the only thing I would add to that is just there are some great physiotherapists in Northern Ireland as well, and in Ireland, and I think inevitably when an injury occurs, and it always does in athletics. It's very rarely random. It's usually a, a it's usually a coaching problem or it's usually a conditioning problem or a mechanical problem. And I think knowing who you can trust as physiotherapists and solving the problem together um, as coach and physio and athlete is really crucial. So, like we've got obviously Peter Scullion who who worked Commonwealth Games with us as a team was really good problem solver. We've got Simon Harland in Northern Ireland, Athletics Ireland. have got Paul Carragher, but I think there's there's a great place for really good beneficial relationships between coaches and physios who can problem solve together and the perspective that each can bring can really supplement each other as well. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's quite a, uh, yeah, a good quality list. And I think, uh, as we know, good quality coaches <coughs> make use of a, a quality team. So, uh, that's uh, Amy Foster, Tom Reynolds, Tom Crick, and Jack Newton uh, there in Northern Ireland. Uh, and Peter, Simon, and Paul Carragher from Classics Island, was that? Or was that the Sport Island? I wasn't sure. Uh, Paul Carragher, he's actually Newry based, has his own clinic and stuff. I know I've worked with him on, on Irish teams. Um, I worked with him around Kate O'Connor. Um, yeah, so he is, he's got multiple roles, but I just know. As problem solving, it you know it really needs to be a collaborative approach, um, and I just think all three of those kind of guys that I've mentioned, all have that collaborative approach where they're willing to look to nutrition for solutions. They're willing to talk to, um, the coach about the volume and load, and they're willing to to appreciate we can solve problems together. Um, I just think quality physiotherapists are, are crucial players in your team, especially as you emerge through talent and into performance. Um. The next question I've got here, I wasn't sure if you, had a, you, you were going to bring up a slide on that one. Um, so, yeah, I can, I can, yeah, briefly do that as well. So this is just one we we often show at our, um, you know, if I'm trying to educate others in, in how to work with services. No, oh, it's maybe not going to show. Um, Yeah, so it's it's just this one here about how with any sort of services it should work. So I suppose it's appreciating on a performance team. This is a, this is actually from Steve Ingham's book. He mm -hmm. was a physiologist in, in Jess Ennis's team, but especially with a multi eventer like Jess, you're gonna have the coach, you're gonna have a physio, soft tissue, physiologist, biomech, maybe a manager, probably a parent. If it's a multi eventer you may have multiple other coaches as well, probably an SSC person. I just think you know, performance coaches need to be leading these these teams. They need to have the background in all of these areas, be a generalist in all of the different areas um, so they can integrate all of it. And then when they make decisions, they're doing it with evidence from all of these people. So it's, um, it's less randomized decision-making and more informed by all of these people with the skill sets. 
Um, so I just think, yeah, I think coaches should really be developing their knowledge in each area and also developing the trusted relationships um, so that they can play all these people. So play all the different players to their strengths. Uh, okay. But you can only do that if you're really good at communicating and really transparent and honest. And I think once people start um, shutting down with each other or not sharing um, and not, not being honest about what's really happening behind the scenes, that's where relationships and performances break down. Yeah, and, and I mean, <clears throat> I, I, we, we talk about the rocky road to uh, success um, and, and the reality is that we all have those moments when things aren't going as, um, as smooth and fluid as, as they were perhaps the previous year. Uh, and dealing with that. And, and I think you touched on the fact that sometimes parents might find that difficult um, to deal with. Um, obviously, athletes do as well. But if, if they know that it's likely to happen or why it's going to happen um, and it can be predicted, but then obviously you can prepare for it. Um, yeah. And I should say as well, it's not just to solve problems. These people around this slide are probably the best, you know, in terms of performance enhancing. The answers to performance enhancement will lie within you know those types of people and so it's not just about communicating when the wheels fall off it's about actually transparency and communication from the outset so that everyone's looking for that edge that performance enhancement absolutely absolutely and um, i think the, the next question we you probably answered it earlier in terms of a uh, key, key tapering um processes for competition and, and I assume they're going to be similar to what you had done or have any differences with the athletes that you coach? Yeah I think just in the last year or two I'm just as I said getting much more to that competition rehearsal um, so preparing all the, the timings and schedulings for call rooms warm-ups number of efforts one thing we can be guilty of in throwing especially is you come out to practice and you have a half an hour long warm-up and then an hour of throwing and you maybe do like 12 easy approach and 12 half approach and maybe six full approach javelin throws in terms of being ready for a competition that's completely unrealistic because in competition you may have you have your warm-up you probably have a 45 minute call room you've got 20 minutes on the field of play in which you might only get two throws um to then take your practice and be ready so i think i've gotten away from you know, in the final weeks into taper from those really extended practices with lots of volume of throwing. Um, and I've gotten more to actually, we need to be able to do this in, you know, within 20 minutes of stepping onto the field of play off to warm up throws, you need to be ready to actually go and achieve a PB. So that's now become a more important part of my taper in those final few weeks is the, that, that preparation to do that and the learning you get from that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's probably the key improvement I'm trying to make. Um, and probably the, the final question I've got for the time being is, uh, what do you do to chill? How does, uh, how does, how does the coach wind down? What does Laura do when she's not coaching? Yeah, um, I definitely like being near the water. Um, I like to paddleboard. I find that you can't, uh, you have to empty your head a little bit for that because if you are not concentrating, it's very easy to fall off. Um, but paddleboarding around the coast um i've started to play a bit of golf in the last few years again i prefer to do that near the coast as well so port rush is ideal um and then just you know I, sport brings me a lot of travel um, and has done i think i would always travel anyway and that's probably a big ambition for the future is you know if i'm not in sport i'll always want to to keep traveling um and i read a lot i would say sport to me is more than just the job you know i, I read in my own time but I read around sport, so I'll read like some of Steve Magnus's books I've read recently, Fergus Connolly's like Game Changer book. So I'll read sports science and performance for my own personal interest. Um, whether that's relaxing or not, I don't know, but it's uh, I keep going back to it, so I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna complain. It's what you do. It's what you do. Um, and the other one is: Are there any events you wish you'd tried? Did you have a fancy doing, you know, mountain running or uh, steeplechasing? Uh, you, not, not, never them. yeah <laughs> not mountain running or steeplechasing um i think multi-events um is an incredibly exciting proposition i think as a coach it's a hugely interesting puzzle to try and solve i very much enjoy working with the the moving parts of you know the 
the heptathlon, the decathlon. Um, I think I wish I'd tr- tried it. I wish I'd had the opportunity um, to do that. I think I probably would have been a much more physically prepared javelin thrower if I'd spent some time in, in multi-events. Um, and yeah, stayed in that. But, you know, you, you can see from Kate O'Connor's uh, javelin throw and record in 2019, like to throw 52 metres 92, I think that's what it was, off throwing javelin typically one day a week. Um, per maybe maybe ball throws, you know, an additional day, but most largely average, you know, throwing javelin one day a week and doing it off half approach. You've got to say that type of performance has come down to being a quality physically prepared athlete. It's not come down to volume of javelin throws or early specialization. And so if we could do with that with more people, you know, why why can't we produce more performances like that off the back of a multi-events program? Um, so I wish I'd done that, but there's a great opportunity now for athletes who've got some good role models. Um, like Kate, we've got some great boys coming through in, in Northern Ireland now. We've had a tradition of, of men at Commonwealth Games. Um, Brendan McConville and Peter Glass and Tom Reynolds, there are role models for it. There are coaches for it. And I think that's a, that's a route we should keep taking with our young athletes as well. Yeah, I think I might have added Mike Ball to that as well. But, uh... yeah, before my time, but yeah. You would and play that, wouldn't you? The, the, the legend that is Mary Peters as well. So. Of course. <laughs> How dare we? How very dare we? <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, and then talking on that one, um, you know, there, there is Masters Athletics, if ever you uh, fancy a devil in that, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll not push you on that one. No, I don't think it'd be good for my credibility with the um, with the Youth Academy athletes right now to be lining up beside them in any event. So um, for credibility reasons, I'm going to avoid Masters. Yeah. Okay. Who knows? I might see you on holiday in Perth, Australia, doing a combined event. Uh, <laughs> you know, in, in later years, who knows? Who knows? Um, can I just say, um, Laura, that's been absolutely ticked off. Lots of gold dust there, lots of great points, uh, particularly for uh, coaches to reflect on, um, for throwers to reflect on. And, and I think that final point you made there about Kate O'Connor, you know, throwing, you know, almost 53 metres, um, of, you know, one day a week jabbing training, you know, for the uh, previous five or 10 years. And uh, yeah, I, I, I've seen her doing uh, some of her physical preparation, you know, when she was 17, 18, 19. And, uh, yeah, very well physically prepared and uh, yeah, a hell of a throw. Congratulations on that. And I'm sure there are more successes coming down the road. But um, thanks again, Laura. That's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Bash. And you're doing good work to get all these people together. So I look forward to the next uh, next videos as well. Well, we're working on it. Any suggestions who we should get next? I'm going to pause it there before you say anything. <laughs>